Hello and welcome to the Employee Advocacy and Influence podcast. My name is Lewis Gray and today we're going to be doing something slightly different from usual. So if you've watched the podcast in the past or if you've listened to the podcast, you'll know that generally speaking, it's myself and Disseminate CEO Bradley Keenan who hosts the show. Today we wanted to do something a little bit different because we had an idea for an episode that actually came from conversations that our customer success teams were having with our clients who are either law firms or working in the legal sector and also conversations that our sales teams were having with law firms who were trying to implement employee advocacy programs. And what we were hearing from both sides was that the, the challenges that law firms face when they're trying to launch an employee advocacy program are very much unique to their industry. So with any kind of new initiative, but with employee advocacy especially, there's going to be challenge that you, challenges that you have to overcome. But if you set up correctly um, and you get things right from day one, generally speaking, all challenges are minor and you can, you can overcome them with ease. But because these were so niche to the legal sector, we thought, what better timing? Because within the past couple of uh, months, we actually hired the amazing Shannon Loveridge, uh, who joins us today and who I'll introduce in just a second. But she actually specialises in the legal sector. Uh, with that said, Shannon, I'll hand you the reins so that you can introduce yourself. Thank you for that very good introduction. So, yeah, to introduce myself, my name is Shannon Loveridge. I've recently joined the Disseminate team within the last month and I work as a business development representative in the commercial team. I have a couple of years of work experience working within the legal sector and with law firms. I've also just completed my Masters of Law too. So now at Disseminate, my role is to help law firms maximize their digital marketing strategy through the use of employee advocacy. Amazing, very exciting stuff. Okay, cool. So with that said, the today's episode is going to focus on the three challenges or the three biggest challenges um, that law firms might face when launching an employee advocacy program um, and how to overcome them. So with all of that said, let's uh, let's get into it. So for the first part of this episode, I wanted to almost go through the history of technological adoption within law firms and within companies and regulated industries in general, because historically law firms and, and all companies within regulated industries have been, and maybe this is a generalization, but they've been notoriously slow at moving forward and adopting new technologies. And they tend to only make transformations when they absolutely have to. So in my mind and from conversations I've had, this is because companies operating in these industries know that there's a large number of hoops to, to jump through before we can get anything signed off or implemented. It obviously makes total sense and it comes with the industry uh, and comes with the territory. But more recently, there seems to have been a, a shift in this attitude. So Shannon, I was hoping you could shed some light on where this you know, change in attitude might have come from and, and why this might be. Sure. So as we know, law firms were typically very hesitant to adopt technology because lawyers are very risk adverse. Recently, we've seen that although some of this hesitancy still remains, that law firms are much more open to digital transformation than they used to be. And I think the main reason for this is because the cost of not adopting and adapting to this new trend is too great for them. So law firms are a business. So by embracing technology, the firm's becoming more profitable and more competitive in their market. So technology offers the potential to streamline certain processes, automate repetitive tasks and improve overall efficiency. And by doing this, law firms are increasing their output and therefore being more productive and more profitable. With the increasing pressure too from clients, Law firms feel that they need to be more cost effective and they've recognized the advantages of adopting technology to enhance this productivity and ultimately give better client service. Clients too have also become more tech savvy. So the law, the legal industry is purely reacting to what their clients want. So now the clients expect law firms to leverage technology to be faster more transparent and offer more cost-effective legal services. Law firms also recognize that adopting technology can provide a general competitive edge too. So implementing innovative solutions to that law firm can help differentiate them in the market. 
attract new clients and retain ex existing ones. Law firms are increasingly realizing that technology adoption is not is a matter of necessity and also a strategic advantage. So I think they're the main points. Yeah, for sure. And there's some some ones that are very much new to me in there as well. I think the one that kind of rings true the most to me is the the consumer demand or the customer demand in this regard, because I get so frustrated when I'm if it's somebody that I'm doing business with or whether I'm just purchasing something when the technology is so far behind what it could be. I really wish I had an example to hand because it was something I was doing recently. I was filling in a survey for something and it was just made so complicated. And I just thought, I know just as a marketer what technology is out there for this kind of technology, uh, this kind of job. And to see it done so poorly is so frustrating. So I can absolutely understand the consumer uh, or the customer demand aspect. Mm. Do you think that's happened more within recent years as a result of, you know, COVID and lockdowns and that kind of thing? Yeah, COVID definitely had an impact for something like document review or um, DocuSign. Previously, certain contracts couldn't be signed online but now they can be signed online from anywhere in the world. So when lawyers could travel to meet their clients in other jurisdictions because of the lockdowns, there was an increase uptake, demand and use of technology that ultimately makes things much more efficient. And now lockdown's over, lawyers could still travel to their clients and very often do, but they've realized that some of these technologies are here to stay because they actually do make processes much more efficient and streamline things so it's had quite a permanent effect so yeah. yeah definitely I think it's almost forced their hand hasn't it it's like during lockdown it was either you adapt or you're not going to be able to do business like you said I didn't realize that everything had to be in person pre-digital transformation within the legal <laughs> sector um but yeah, I guess it's kind of forced their hand. It's like, if you're not going to do these things, then as a business, you're not going to make any money. You're not mm. going to be able to thrive. So um, I'm, I'm curious to know, I don't suppose you know why DocuSign wasn't accepted before. Was it just like tradition or was it a reluctance to pick up a, a new technology, like a security risk kind of thing? I think it's because certain contracts can't actually be legally binding if they're not signed. So it wasn't a form of accepted way to sign a contract. So certain things still do need to be signed in wetting. I think maybe deeds and things, certain certain contracts need to be signed in, in you know, wet ink and pen. So yeah. if they were signed online, they weren't actually valid. So nothing, you know, they weren't actually, they, they couldn't be used. So with the I mean, creation this is of DocuSign, the... now they can do it online. Now they can get it done. Yeah, for mm. sure. I've always seen DocuSign as gospel. You know, I sign everything with DocuSign now. When we hire new employees, everything's over DocuSign. It's very rare that we actually put pen to paper. But again, yeah. that's because, you know, when we think about the, the legal sector, it's so niche and the challenges that they face are so specific to that industry. Um mm -hmm. I guess bringing it back to social media and employee advocacy, where do you think, I mean, I've seen this from the, the legal sector, the growing demand, but where do you think the, the new demand for social media usage and employee advocacy has come from? And am I even right in saying that, that it's kind of, you know, increase in demand has surged? It definitely has. I think it comes from, again, evolving client expectations. Most people are on social media and typically before you do business with anyone or go to a restaurant or do anything you'll normally look them up on social media to see what their you know their their profile is or what social proof they have their reviews things like that now that's a very common way of deciding whether you want to hire someone you maybe you check out their linkedin profile so it works both ways um also as well i think they've also Law firms have also realized the business development opportunities that come from social media. So being able to strategically lever leverage social media, they can advertise them and present themselves as thought leaders and industry experts to their target audience. And also as well for recruitment and talent acquisition purposes, typically when a law firm will hire someone, they can hire someone from as young as 18, 19. So that generation are definitely going to be on social media. So they realize by 
being on social media like LinkedIn and advertising their jobs on LinkedIn and having a really active company page. That's what potential candidates who they're targeting are going to be looking at. And they're going to be looking at the firm and the online reputation that it has and trying to figure out the culture before they apply. So I think it's come again, yeah, from clients, customers, potential candidates. It's interesting you say about, yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting what you were saying about, you know, when no matter what you're doing, if you're paying somebody for their services, you generally speaking, will look them up online you'll just if you were using linkedin but you know my uh my girlfriend works in music so for her it's she'll check out people's instagram pages and stuff like that but for me definitely like we were recently looking for a graphic designer just for a, a piece of content we were producing um and the first thing i did obviously I, I did a bit of independent research but then i just took straight to linkedin you know just to see mm-hmm. were these people talking about their work were they showcasing what they were doing and the ones who were, even if I didn't like the work, they would still have, I mean, I'm not a graphic designer, I don't really have a say in that, but the ones who weren't were immediately at a disadvantage because I then have that thought in the back of my mind, they just don't care enough to showcase their work and to be active on a professional network. So immediately the people who were posting had an advantage. So I could see how that would work from a, a legal perspective. Personally, I've never had to Fortunately, um, I've never had to, to reach out for, for legal help to date. But again, it would be the first thing that I checked. I'd be, you know, doing some research. I might utilize uh, some, uh, I call it network influence, but I might reach out to people in my network on LinkedIn for a bit of help. But then again, it's going to their LinkedIn feeds and just seeing, are they regularly posting? What are they talking about? And again, mm-hmm. the ones who are silent, maybe Shannon, you can, you, you might disagree with this, but the ones who are silent to me, seem to be maybe again it's a bit of a generalization but they seem to be less involved in in what they're doing do you get the same or am i am i running on too much no i totally think that's true and i think because it's now the norm to be on social media and to be active by not being on there you know it looks strange why wouldn't they want to if they really are an amazing firm an amazing company why wouldn't they be wanting to promote themselves and showcase all of their best work it would make sense that they would they're just would be proud of themselves and proud of their team and proud of everything that they've achieved that they would want to share that and they would want to you know show themselves off in the best light so by not doing that it does raise some suspicions of why not so for sure and that just comes to I think that's it what you've just said is exactly what I was trying to say but I was just running on and trying to explain it it's why not why aren't you showcasing your expertise and I think what you said earlier as well is relevant here which is uh the emerging workforce or not even the emerging workforce um let's just say that the tech native workforce are kind of growing up Mm -hmm. and using social media to to check out companies before they apply for jobs so again if you're looking at a law firm and they're not posting anything they don't seem to have a strong employer brand there's no company culture content in the back of your mind you're just going to be thinking why not so i think you've you've summarized it very nicely there yeah and the legal industry spend more on recruitment than any other sector oh, because wow. that, yeah they spend some of the top law firms spend on average of one million pounds from first interaction with that potential candidate all the way up to when they qualify so they invest so much in their trainees so it's so important for them to make what is a very you know appropriate business decision so they want to attract the right people and they know that by being on social media and being more public with the work that they're doing they can access and reach their you know the candidates that they want so the next challenge is one that just about all companies that attempt to launch an employee advocacy program have to overcome but it's especially prevalent in the legal sector just due to the the workload of most employees and the challenge is getting company-wide adoption now what i mean by company-wide adoption is If you're launching and attempting to scale an employee advocacy program, you'll be using an employee advocacy tool. This will just centralize all of your content and allows you to optimize, scale, and track the success of your program. But of course, this becomes something that your lawyers or employees have to start using. So you're introducing another tool to their tech stack. The feedback that we've had from program managers and and prospects our sales teams are, are speaking with is that their colleagues won't see the point and that they'll struggle to get them on board with using this tool that, you know, they've um, identified as the the right tool for their employee advocacy efforts. So 
Shannon, I was I was hoping you could lend some insight as to, to why this might be the case and how can these program managers achieve better adoption rates? Well, I think the main thing for lawyers is time constraints, workload. They have very heavy workloads, tight deadlines, so they may perceive adopting an additional tool into their and using a new platform into their day as unnecessary and it's not a priority to their other their billable hours, their work that they have to do, because that that's not a billable hour. They're not meeting their targets for doing something that's not their work. So I think the way to do this is that the way to overcome this is to highlight the cost saving aspects of the employee advocacy tool. So I think it has to be emphasized how streamlining content, simplifying social media man- management and and how it reduces manual efforts. I think it's one of those things like we mentioned before, if you have a culture in your firm where everybody does post on social media and the leadership team do it and you don't and you look like the odd one out, then you're not going to be looking as engaged as other people and then that will reflect on you. So your managers might be asking, why aren't you as active as everybody else? Why aren't you engaging? And it's just a personal brand thing. So people who are active and posting and engaging, they are more engaged with their work. They do have higher productivity rates and overall, you know, happiness in their job role. So there are lots of benefits, but I think maybe because they're not aware of them, they don't know. Sure. I think the key thing is to make sure that it's integrated into the training. So when you start at a firm, that is offered in the onboarding. They do social media onboarding and they already do that too because there's very strict rules around what people can post and what they can't post for obvious reasons. So by integrating how they can use the employee advocacy tool to ensure that they are posting the right thing, then they that takes that stress off their mind because maybe for some reason lawyers are, firms don't want to post because they're really worried about sharing the wrong thing. But if they know that there's a tool out there that can reduce that risk or completely mitigate it, then they're going to be more inclined to do it. So, and also as well, getting the leadership on board and having that ongoing engagement um, and just, yeah, just addressing concerns and providing ongoing support and things like that. So if the, um, the leaders are doing it and they're setting the example, then then the more the more junior people they'll be on board too so yeah definitely i think that's the top down approach is something that we see across the board i think with when you're launching any new initiative really obviously influence starts at the top so if you have your executives and your senior leaders uh adopting a tool from from day one and they start using it then obviously it becomes so much harder for anybody else to to not use it, to justify not using it even, especially if you're putting it down to time restraints. Um, Generally speaking, it's the senior leaders and the executives who are going to be the most busy uh, employees within your workforce. So if they're able to do it, I think the the excuse of it being a a time taxing task kind of goes out the window, really. But something you mentioned a moment ago as well about kind of I guess it all ties in with communicating the the benefits to employees, mm-hmm. obviously, if you make it part of onboarding. And it just made me think about a, a piece of content we produced recently. We actually did a podcast episode on it as well, which we'll, we'll link to in the show notes. Um, but it was about putting together your ideal advocate profile. And what that meant was it's essentially like with any any great marketing or any sales process, you put together personas. And that's essentially what this document that we created allows you to do is to identify who you want to invite to your program, what are their current business objectives, what are their pain points, what kind of content would they be, would it benefit them to share? Um, And there's a few other things in there as well, but those just kind of help you realize how to communicate the benefits to your employees. And in this instance, your lawyers. So if you're saying to them, if if you feel like you're asking them to do something and, and going above and beyond, you kind of need to make it about them and their business objectives and, and doing this just kind of allows you to to do that. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Do you think, do you think Shannon, that I, is there still a attitude within the, the sector where people see social media as a nice to have and not a, an essential? So there's definitely still that attitude. 
law firms have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years and social media is only a, a relatively new concept. Employee advocacy is an even newer one. If they were able to operate for this long without social media, maybe they think that it's not necessary to have because they're doing fine without it. However, as the market changes and cons consumer shifts, client shifts, all of these things happen and they get more and more, there's more and more pressure on law firms to do these things. I think that's when they'll start realizing that it's definitely a must have, because as we said, if they're not doing it and everybody else is, they're going to be left out. Um, but yeah, I think the, there is, there's a growing sentiment now that it's definitely one of those things that they just have to be on. But one of the things that we see is when we're speaking to partners, trying to get them on board and convincing them sometimes is quite hard because they've been around and they've been working in their firm for maybe 30, 40 years, and they've never had to use social media before. So n not only do they probably don't know how, maybe they don't know how to use it in a way that would optimize their business goals. And secondly, yeah, like I said, if they were able to operate for so long without doing it, they may not think that they have to do it. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think if you're, I guess if you're an experienced lawyer um, and you're at the top of your game and you've been, you know, doing what you do for, for 30, 40 years, however long, then, you know, I'm not too uh, involved in the industry, but I imagine you get to a point where your reputation kind of precedes you and maybe then they just think, okay, I don't need to be active on social media. Um, mm -hmm. But I digress. Um, Shannon, I think we, we've covered quite a few points with this one particular challenge. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I was just wondering, would you be able to to summarize the, I think it was four or five things we've mentioned there, but could you just summarize mm -hmm. those points for how to maximize, maximize adoption rates? Sure. So highlight the time-saving aspects of using an employee advocacy tool. Conduct thorough communication and training sessions. So integrate social media training into the onboarding process so people know what to do from the get-go of joining and have that ongoing engagement and support and also support from senior leadership, get them on board as well. Um, and also just have a dedicated support system. So if employees do have any questions, then you can address their concerns. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Let's get on to the next challenge. So for the third challenge or the third part of this episode, I wanted to get into how you can overcome the perceived risk that somebody will say the wrong thing on social media. So this challenge is a big one when it comes to employee advocacy, fears and the perceived risks. Obviously, in any industry, but with the legal sector especially, you don't want your employees to say the wrong thing on social media. We hear this quite a lot as an objection uh, to employee advocacy, but this is especially the case within the legal industry where lawyers are under additional pressure to remain compliant and discreet. So, Shannon, I'm not going to build on this challenge and this point too much because I feel like it's clear. But what I want to understand is how can law firms overcome this perceived risk and, and can you kind of debunk it a little bit? So the thing that they can do to mitigate this is to use an employee advocacy tool. So they can have clear social media guidelines so people know what to post. They can have that education around posting and what good practice looks like. There's normally a content approval process anyway, so law firms and other regulated in companies in regulated industries will have a process where they screen and they check documents and whatever's going out to be posted to make sure everything is fine and having that ongoing monitoring and compliance to make sure that there's monitoring and tools that detect and address any problematic posts that could you know harm reputation and things like that by using an employee advocacy tool employees would only be able to post things that were pre-approved by the by the company so there would be no fear around posting because everything that's on the platform has already been approved and there would be no fear around writing captions and writing original content and things like that because there will be a feature where they will have pre-generated captions by the company and that they will have already chosen for them and they can just choose which one they want and suits their online profile the most so it's very much most most of it's already done for them and they just have to use the they just have to use the platform they can auto schedule posts so things can go out and everything's already pre-approved and they'll have multiple versions of each piece of content and they just pick the one that they like the most awesome yeah i think that's a 
in my mind, that's all somebody would need to hear. But I mean, to, to give some examples, we obviously, like I said at the beginning, we have a number of uh, clients that are law firms. Um, and one of the things that we've heard from, or at least that I got from speaking with the customer success teams, is that we do try to keep it platform agnostic on this podcast. Um, but most employee advocacy tools or most, most good employee advocacy tools will give you this feature to like Shannon said, pre-write captions that you can offer your employees so that they can use them when sharing. Obviously, it mitigates the risk that they'll share the wrong thing um, or say the wrong thing, and you can lock those captions in place too. Uh, but what they were doing was essentially, so the content curators, so the people who are writing the captions for their employees to use, were taking uh, bits of content that had already been published on the website and using that as the caption because they knew that that had already been approved through legal and yeah. was was good to share. So That's it wasn't that they had to go away and, and write anything. It was just like, okay, for for anybody curating content for employee advocacy, one of the most time taxing but important parts, so it does play an instrumental role, is writing a good caption. And I think if you're if you have it in the back of your mind that it's this difficult thing and you have to be legally compliant, that example to me was just like the perfect workaround. It's like you've got the captions written mm -hmm. in your content. You just need to chop it up and make it a bit more social. Uh, sorry, a bit more suitable for social. But, you know, it's then it's good to go. Yeah. And law firms are very actively posting things on their website. So if you go on a law firm's website, they'll have blogs, they'll have articles, they'll have thought leadership pieces. They're always producing content and there is so much on there. So they don't necessarily have to even find new content. They just have to go back and they can link their website to their employee advocacy platform. And then that will feed content through automatically that's already been approved. Or they can go through and, you know, create something, create something original out of content that's already been vetted by the legal team. So solves that issue. For sure. And I think even content segmentation has a role to play here. But I was speaking, so I'm working on a, a case study with one of our clients at the moment. Um, and they did an exceptional job because they're such an enormous company. They did such a great job of getting the right content to the right people because they produce so much content in so many different languages. And for their employee advocacy efforts, they invited employees from all of these different teams across the world. So into the platform so they had to ensure that what each individual employee was seeing was relevant to them and they did that by curating sorry um creating groups within uh the platform that were just so specific but also it kind of mirrored the business structure so rather mm -hmm. than trying to make things over complicated and going for just uk or uk marketing or whatever they just broke it down uh they looked at the business structure and mirrored that and created their grouping like yeah. that so Again, I imagine with the, the legal sector, that's just something that will, again, help mitigate any potential risk is, you know, that if a lawyer is being served a piece of content to share, it's, it's being curated for them. It's not, you know, the CEO could share it and then, a, I don't know, a, or a partner, sorry, could share it and they could have a, I'm not too familiar with legal uh, job titles here, but somebody more g junior could come in and share the same mm -hmm. piece of content. It might be a bit odd. Obviously, certain content is relevant to to certain yeah. people, right? I guess that helps alleviate risk too. Yeah, and that mirrors the law firm's business structure because they'll have different departments that do different things. So you could be in the IP department, you could be in the tax department, the finance department, and on the law firm's website when they release their blogs and their news and their news feed about deals that they've just completed, it you can filter by department and filter by industry and filter by sector. So if you work in a particular sector or you specialize in a particular industry or something like that, then all of the content's already pre-filtered. Brilliant. So we've covered quite a lot in this episode. Um, and obviously, Shannon, with the, the last point I, I asked you to summarize, so I feel like we've got a, a great summary of the points that we've been through so far. I think what it might be useful for you to do, and again, I apologize. I know this is your first podcast. I feel like I'm putting you on the spot here, but would it be possible to kind of go through the three biggest misconceptions and just summarize the the three biggest myths let's call them actually and and kind of debunk them sure myth one is that using social media compromises client confidentiality so this is actually not true it's a misconception that this jeopardizes client confidentiality because by establishing clear guidelines and educating employees 
law firms can regulate what things go on social media and what things don't. So it's all in the education and all in the policies that they have. So like I said, by integrating this through training, onboarding, people know from the get go what they can post and what they can't post. So if anything, you're actually reducing the risk because you're, you're demonstrating to people what, what, what can be put online and what can't be. And if you never teach them and you never have a social media policy in place, then they won't know. And they're actually more at risk of posting something and, you know, jeopardizing client confidentiality. So the second myth is that employee advocacy and using social media creates conflicts of interest. So the belief is that social media blurs the professional boundaries leading to conflicts of interest. But similar to the first point I made, law firms can mitigate this risk just by implementing a robust, a robust conflict checking procedure. So they scan social media to ensure that all of the interactions that are happening on, the, happening on there align with the firm's ethical and legal obligations. So it's all in the processes and the procedures. And the final myth is that social media and using social media dilutes professionalism. So I think that social media is wrongly associated with not being professional. Something like LinkedIn was created as a professional networking site. So law firms can maintain their professionalism by adhering to codes of conduct, promoting thought leadership, engaging in meaningful discussions to showcase their expertise and respect. So it's all about the way that they use social media. People have private social medias that are used for very different purposes. However, I would argue that the purpose of using LinkedIn and posting content on there is to enhance your professionalism and your personal brand that will give you kudos in the workplace. So. Amazing. Yeah, I think um, I said I put you on the spot because it was your first episode. But I think you've done an amazing job of summarising there. Um, we'll have to get you on more often. Um, so that's a, I guess I'm a, we do say we keep it platform agnostic. I'm a platform advocate. I would say with, with, with all the things that Shannon's brilliantly summarised there, get yourself an employee advocacy tool if you're going to leverage employee advocacy because it solves all of these problems. Um, but again, platform advocate. Um, Shannon, thank you so much for, for joining us for today's episode. You've been an invaluable uh, uh, source of insight. Um, if for anybody listening or watching, if you've enjoyed this episode, please, it would mean the world if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts or watch them. Um, and if you wanted to connect with myself or Shannon, you can do so on LinkedIn um, and we'll pop the resources that we've mentioned below and there'll be links to our LinkedIn profiles as well. So we'll catch you very soon. Thank you very much for listening. Bye.